The Strongs aren't one of the more known noble houses in the story, especially if you're only coming into House of Dragon from Game of Thrones. Most book readers will only vaguely recognize the name too, because these 30 or so years of lore that the prequel is adapting is the only real time in this fake world that the Strong family was relevant. The Targaryens have a good relationship with House Strong, stemming back from Aegon the Conqueror, but season 1 of House the Dragon is House Strong in their prime, claiming descent from the First Men, so this is a very ancient house, we're talking like 10,000 years back, though their only castle that we know of is Harrenhal, and they were only gifted this seat very recently. They got on Aegon Targaryen's good terms during his conquest when they rose up against their oppressors to help Aegon bring the Riverlands into the Seven Kingdoms. Those oppressors were House Hor, the people responsible for building Harrenhal, the largest castle in Westeros. The first name Strong is Sir Osmond Strong, who was one of the many handed the kings to Aegon the Conqueror during his 37 year long reign. Osmond was his right hand man for the later half. He wouldn't be the only member of his house to serve the Targaryen's court before Lionel. A character named Sir Lucimore Strong was appointed to the old King Jaehaerys' Kingsguard 56 years after Aegon's conquest, after he won attorney melee showing off his skill. This guy is very controversial in the lower book, Fire and Blood. During his time as a member of the Kingsguard, his family was thriving. Lucimore was a favorite amongst the small folk, even liked by the highborns at court. King Jaehaerys decided this was the time to elevate the Strongs as Lords of Harrenhal. A lot of nobles have come and gone in this castle, but it had been vacant for a while, so it might as well reward a loyal vassal, while also have them deal with the crazy upkeep for a castle of this size. Lucimore's brother, Bywin, became the first strong with the title of Lord of Harrenhal. But in that same year, Lucimore almost threw away all of his family's social ladder progress. During his time as a Kingsguard member, he was living a double life, a quadruple life actually. He vowed to never take a wife or father any children when being sworn in by the old king but he decided to go out and find himself three wives who he had 16 children with. Don't know how he found the time, or how none of the other women knew about the other wives. A huge shock to the city, something TMZ or a small time YouTuber would have milked to no end for some views. When his lord commander found out, he asked the old king to order the death of Sir Lucimore for breaking his vows so excessively. When dragged before the Iron Throne, Sir Lucimore fell to his knees confessing his guilt, and begged the king for mercy. Jaehaerys might well have granted him some, but the errant knight made the fatal error of appending for the sake of my wives and children to his plea. This was tantamount to throwing his crimes in the king's face. The king said, I wanted no oathbreakers around me, then or now. Sir Lucimore, you swore a sacred vow before the gods and men to defend me and mine own with your life, to obey me, fight for me, die for me if need be. You also swore to take no wife, father, no children, and remain chaste. If you could shrug aside the second vow so easily, why should I believe you would honor the first? Then Queen Alice spoke up saying, You made a mockery of your oaths as a knight of the king's guard, but those are not the only vows you broke. You dishonored your marriage vows as well, not once but thrice. None of these women are lawfully wed, so these children I see behind you are bastards, one and all. They are the true innocents in this, sir. Your wives were ignorant of one another, I am told, but each of them must surely have known that you were a white sword, a knight of the king's guard. To that extent, they share your guilt, as does whatever drunken septon you found to marry you. For them, some mercy may be warranted, but for you, I will not have you near my lord, sir. Jaehaerys commanded that Sir Lucimore be gelded forthwith, then clapped in irons and sent to the wall. Jaehaerys left it to his queen to deal with the three families, so a lot of strong bastards got dispersed out the Seven Kingdoms, and the small folk looked back at all the gossip Lucimore entertained them with fondly. Jaehaerys didn't give up on how strong or anything because of one man's mistakes. Bywin kept Harrenhal, and his descendant Lionel would take over after him, the same Lionel in House the Dragon. King Viserys had to bring him into the picture as part of a small council after Prince Daemon turned out to be unfit for governing and advising. Lionel had the reputation of being competent. Few knew how intelligent he truly was because of how quiet and less ambitious he was than others of his era. But Lionel, as powerful as he was, decided to spend his time in the Citadel. Only going by his large stature and slow speech, many assumed he was all brawn and no brain. The Strongs seemed to be built to be warriors. Lionel is a man who was able to forge six links to a maester's chain, which is nothing to scoff at. It meant he had full understanding of six different subject matters, like healing or history. Lionel's expertise was laws, however, and replacing Daemon as the master of laws on the small council was why he was brought to court. A lord forging a maester's chain is not very common. It's usually a younger brother or a cousin that does so because he has little chance of ever leading the house and needs to find purpose elsewhere. Lionel was a lord and just had a thirst for knowledge. A maester's life just wasn't for him, so he didn't become one. The position of master of laws is exactly what it sounds like. 
being a primitive version of a lawyer or a judge. He was so good at advising Viserys that after four years on the small council, he was promoted to Hand of the King, a very elite position. The second strong to be a king's right-hand man, but not a position that's very glamorous because of how much serious work it entails. Otto Hightower, the former Hand, that had to be removed for how ambitious he was, couldn't even hide his interest in elevating his own family, House Hightower. This made Lionel that much better, contrasting Otto. Lionel didn't have to be conniving to raise his family standings. Two out of four of his children that he brought to court would get elite positions. During his life, he went through three wives and became a widower three times. But any further details aren't given to us. His two maiden daughters became handmaids to Princess Rhaenyra, whilst their elder brother, Sir Howman Strong, called Breakbones, was made a captain in the Gold Cloaks. The younger boy, Laris the Clubfoot, joined the King's Confessors, so he had some interrogation and torturing responsibilities for prisoners. Before long, it would be Laris also getting a promotion, as the Lord Confessor, who leads all the other Confessors. He was also given a spot on the small council as of a series of Master of Whispers, two jobs that involve some dark practices. Where the prequel and lore books differ is how much focus is shifted amongst the strong family at court. Lionel's got a fair share amount of camera time, as he should. But the daughters are cut from the show as far as we know. Harwin, for some reason, is given very little time in the spotlight, as important as he is. And Laris actually gets a whole new layer of his characterization added. He's the mysterious character that no one truly understands or cares to understand in the books, going by unnoticed. But that's because Fire and Blood is written in the perspective of a maester. There's some nuance that comes with television. Still nothing compared to the actual novels, of course, because they go inside the characters' heads, unlike Fire and Blood. He was able to work in the shadows because like his father, Laris was known to be quiet and his brother took all the attention from him. Harwin was everything his little brother wasn't. Laris Clubfoot has a crippled leg from a birth defect, keeping him away from the tourney yard and tourneys, while Harwin was the strongest man of this era. A plotline cut from the show was the early moments of Harwin and Rhaenyra's flirtations before he went and made some Targaryen bastards for her labeled as Valerions. During the tourney celebrating the wedding between Princess Rhaenyra and Laenor Valerion, the books are purposely ambiguous about what exactly led to the falling out between the princess and her sworn shield, Kristen Cole of the Kingsguard. But afterwards, she gave her favor to Harwin in this tourney instead of Kristen, and Kristen fought for Queen Alicent Hightower. In this wedding tourney, as strong as Breakbones was, Kristen outskilled him in the tourney melee and seriously injured him. Harwin was left with a broken collarbone and shattered elbow. An infamous court jester would refer to him as Broken Bones afterwards. All we see in the show is Kristen bait Harwin into attacking him after publicly calling Rhaenyra's boys his bastard sons. It was just an insinuation, but everyone knew what he was doing. There was a brawl involving Harwin in the books that led to his removal from court, but again, little details are given with who was involved in this format of storytelling. Big spoilers if you haven't seen the sixth episode of House of the Dragon, but very soon after he is heading back to Harrenhal, a fire takes his and his father's life. There were many rumored suspects in what was ultimately declared an accident. The three big names being either the rogue prince Daemon, the sea snake Corys Valerion, and little brother Larys Clubfoot. This location is considered to be cursed for all the deaths that come to occupants, so that only helped the perpetrators to get away with it. All three would have their reasons for wanting Harwin dead. Daemon always had his eyes on the princess and what being her husband would do for his life. Corlys as revenge for one of those so-called Valyrians being actual Valyrians, and Laris would be the Lord of Harrenhal with his father and brother out of the picture. House the Dragon doesn't bother playing out this mystery on screen. They straight up show Laris order their deaths. Laris didn't rush over to rule Harrenhal and the surrounding lands. He left his great uncle Simon Strong to look over the place as a castellan. There are some unnamed cousins mentioned living in Harrenhal, but they're not important. There is one strong family member that is as mysterious as Alaris in the books. Her name is Alice Rivers, which makes her a bastard born from a Riverlands noble. She may be Lionel's bastard, but it's not concrete, so hopefully House of Dragon develops this character as well as their handling Laris. They added a whole other layer to him, aside from being a villain. His sociopathy is at a point where he claims that children and love are a weakness. Jaceres, Luceres, and Joffrey will never receive the strong surname, even if Harwin being the father isn't much of a secret. Neither Harwin or Laris get married. If this is how Laris feels about having children, this family line is in trouble. Where are Lionel's handmade daughters when you need them? In House of the Dragon, it appears Laris has made an effort to create a personal sigil. How strong sigil depicts the Riverland's iconic massive rivers, the blue, red, and green fork. Laris's is a little firefly. Normal for a second-born son to do so. 
but weird for a character that doesn't care about his lineage. Not like he's creating a house, just a big ego thing. I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of Lairs after all the setup for his interest in Alice and Hightower's faction at court. But this is how strong leading up to House the Dragon. Happy to see them be such fan favorites.